if you have a daughter in high school, she's more likely to consider attempting suicide than to suffer from asthma. If you have a family of four or more, either you or your family member will suffer from an anxiety or depressive disorder at some point. And every year, in the US alone, more than 10 million people are physically abused by their intimate partners. That means more than 300 people during this talk. We are in the midst of several epidemics. How did we get here? And while it's important to treat the millions of suffering individuals, clearly it's not enough. In our pursuit of happiness, we are missing something important. And I want to introduce to you today one of the powerful missing pieces, which is compassion. And by that, I mean compassion towards ourselves and compassion towards others. I've had the privilege of caring for a few hundred amazing patients every year. The stories I'm going to tell you today are based on a few prototypes from having seen several patients with similar presentations. So they don't represent any one person in particular. A few years ago, on a sunny summer afternoon, I was in a session with a high school student. Let's call her Jane. Jane was smart and vivacious. That day, she was telling me that she was getting all A's at school. She was the president of her school's geography club. She had good friends and a supportive boyfriend. Her parents were very proud of her. And she had been feeling good. But all of a sudden, she started crying. I asked her what happened. She paused, slowly looked up, and said something that was shocking. She said that if she didn't win the geography trivia contest at her school, she was going to kill herself. Now, suicidal thoughts usually result from a complex interplay of biological and psychosocial factors. So I don't want to simplify this or say that addressing any one factor will make this go away. But like many suicidal teens, Jane was not viewing herself as the invaluable person she was. She was beating herself up quite a lot. And I started to wonder, how did grades or performance gain so much importance that these things started superseding life itself? What if Jane had learned at school to practice self-compassion? That day, the next patient I saw was a 10-year-old underweight girl, Amber. Amber was a sweet girl, eager to please everyone. She told me how she couldn't eat most foods. She had gone through extensive GI testing, and everything had come out normal. So this was not because of any problem with her GI tract. This was because whenever she saw herself in the mirror, she saw fat hanging from her body. There was no fat hanging from her body. She was underweight. She denied any depressive symptoms. So did her parents. But most of the time, she worried that she wasn't good enough. Do you know that seven out of 10 girls believe that they are not good enough? And how many of you worry about fat when you look at yourself in the mirror? Imagine being 10 and feeling this way. So every day at my clinic presented with the same theme. Most patients, whether age 7 or age 77, whether suffering from depression, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, OCD, PTSD, even when these conditions were in remission, were having a really hard time being compassionate to themselves. And this lack of self-compassion wasn't only restricted to patients. The other day, I went to a social gathering. And when psychiatrists go to social events, one of two things happens. People either really want to talk to us, or they really don't want to talk to us. <laughs> and someone usually says, you must be psychoanalyzing me. <laughs> so at one of these events, I ran into a friend. She looked radiant. So I gave her a compliment. I said, your skin looks beautiful. And she replied, I hate my skin. It's flabby. I was taken aback. Here I was, genuinely complimenting her. And she couldn't believe it. So I did the most natural thing anyone would do in that circumstance. I checked my own skin to see whether it was flabby or not, <laughs> right? <laughs> the 
this constant pursuit of perfection in every sphere of life is not helping this epidemic of lack of self-compassion. We want perfect hair, a perfect body, perfect grades, perfect house, perfect clothes, the list goes on. But perfection is an imperfect concept. When we chase perfection and fall short, we fault ourselves. Then we feel low. Is it surprising then that so many people are struggling to feel good, despite the fact that we have the most modern technologies at our fingertips? At another social event, I ran into this smart young woman. She always looked so gorgeous as if she just stepped out of a magazine cover. So I said to her, you look amazing. And she said, really? I've always thought my face looks like a cabbage. <laughs> a cabbage? You mean the vegetable? I had never heard of faces being assessed using a vegetable scale. But I started to wonder which vegetable my face would look like. <laughs> Potato? Eggplant? Bell pepper? <laughs> Have you noticed this? We expect compassion from our family, our friends, our colleagues, our bosses. We are very upset when any of these people says anything critical to us, aren't we? But when it comes to treating ourselves, what do we do? We give ourselves a beating. So while many treatments for depression, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, OCD, PTSD, and other psychiatric conditions need to be medication-based or biological or therapy-based, and we need to use all the tools we have to address these impairing conditions, but we can't fully resolve these without addressing this common underlying theme, the lack of self-compassion. So we are teaching kids extensive details of geography, history, math, all of which are valuable, and I remember and use them every day. No, I don't. <laughs> but why are we not teaching kids self-compassion at school? And what is self-compassion anyway? Self-compassion means a non-judgmental acceptance of self while being aware of our shortcomings. Research shows that self-compassion can improve motivation, mastery of goals, and even life satisfaction. Self-compassion training can even help people accept responsibility for failures. How often does that happen? With less negative emotion. So teachers, if you want your students to accept your constructive feedback well, get them to practice self-compassion first. Coming back to Jane, our high school student who was thinking of killing herself, with the help of intensive therapy, she learned to practice compassion towards herself. Gradually, she realized that grades were only a part of her experience. Grades weren't her. She started valuing and accepting herself as a human being, regardless of her performance. So after all this talk about compassion, let's talk a little bit about what compassion is. I'll tell you a little story about it. When I was age five, I used to spend a lot of time with my beloved, now departed grandmother in India. I noticed that she would go to the terrace every morning, and every afternoon she would go out somewhere. One day, I decided to follow her. What I found was interesting, that she was spreading grains for birds on the terrace every morning, and every afternoon, she would go give the cows and dogs in the neighborhood some bread she had cooked. I asked her if the cows were able to appreciate the taste of her cooking. She replied that there is nobody to care for these cows, these dogs, and these birds. They need someone to care for them. I noticed that the cow did look lonely. Compassion means noticing someone's suffering with a strong desire to relieve that suffering. Even 1.5 million years ago, great apes and early humans showed signs of compassionate behavior. Chimpanzees would hug the chimpanzee that lost in a fight. So we were born to be compassionate. And do you know that compassion can alter neural wiring in, even in adult brains? So let me tell you a few stories about the other side of compassion, which is compassion towards others. One day, 
a depressed pregnant woman came to see me for treatment. She had two young children. Her husband was having an affair. Her boss was yelling at her at her minimum wage job. Imagine this lady, eight months pregnant, dragging herself to work every day, having panic attacks when she reached work, afraid that she'd get fired if she took more time off. Her young family depended on her job. But every day, she would hear from her husband, why was she making a big deal out of all this? She had a serious medical condition on top of her pregnancy. To be compassionate to her husband, he was probably feeling overwhelmed himself. But despite working every waking minute, she started feeling like she wasn't being a good mom, or a good wife, or a good employee. She started having thoughts of wishing she were dead. But she didn't want to act on these thoughts. She wanted to be there for her children. On another day, I saw a middle-aged corporate lawyer. He was struggling with panic attacks, as his client would frequently yell at him to produce large amounts of work at short notice. He started feeling like a failure because he couldn't provide as well for his wife and his kids. On another day, I saw a nine-year-old boy. He said that he wasn't feeling good enough because he was struggling with math. And it was really hard for him to get past his belief of not being good enough because he was constantly hearing from his parents and teachers that he was lagging behind. He started feeling down. He started becoming quiet and he started losing interest in his favorite activities. Now, why did I tell you these three stories? Because I want you to imagine how this pregnant woman, this middle-aged lawyer, and this nine-year-old might have felt differently if they had received more compassion from people around them. What if this pregnant woman's husband had said to her, I know this is really hard for you. I'll be there. What if the parents and teachers of this nine-year-old had focused on the things he was good at, such as reading and art? Self-compassion and compassion towards others are closely intertwined. When children start believing that they are not good enough, they can turn to bullying in an unconscious attempt to make themselves look better. Every middle schooler or high schooler I have seen has been bullied at some point. And you can think about the last one week in your life you may have experienced road rage. Or when you turned on the news, maybe you heard of some violent event. I'm not saying that there is no compassion in the world right now. We do hear amazing stories about compassion all the time. But what I am saying is that we are in dire need of more compassion. Without compassion towards others, the world cannot survive. And without compassion towards ourselves, a reservoir of compassion towards others gets drained very quickly. So how powerful would it be if every child learned at school to practice compassion, the same way every child learns to read or write? We now know that compassion training decreases anger, decreases depression and anxiety, improves pro-social behavior, and improves the ability to cope. Wouldn't it make sense to teach something that improves all aspects of emotional health like compassion does? We all have an inner child longing to feel understood, accepted, and loved. We often expect this love or acceptance to come from others, but we haven't learned to give this child our own acceptance. Let's do this little exercise. This exercise is often practiced by compassion-focused therapists. It's going to be relaxing for me. <laughs> if you like, close your eyes. Now think of yourself at age five. Think of this five-year-old child standing in front of you. Think of an incident in the last one week where you beat yourself up about something or where you were self-critical. Imagine this five-year-old child experiencing that criticism and feeling miserable because of it. What would you say to this child? You can open your eyes. Did any of you feel like telling this child, you're stupid, you made a huge mistake? I doubt it. Many of you may have felt like giving this child reassurance or giving this child a hug. When our inner child feels invalidated or is suffering, 
We will see the effects of this invalidation seep onto our outside world. But compassion allows us to move ahead. It allows us to fully realize our potential. It allows us to get past this suffering. When I see patients, the most common reason they come back to see me is not because I give them a certain medication or a unique intervention that can't be found anywhere else. It is because they know that I will be there. Through their pain, through the silence, through the suffering, through the disappointments, through the victories, through their journey, they can sense my deep wish that they heal and recover. And you, my friends, deserve your own compassion. You deserve your own acceptance. Grades, performance, or appearance cannot define you. You're already precious just by virtue of being a human being. The main limiting factor in your pursuit of happiness is going to be whether you treat yourself with love or whether you beat yourself up. Compassion will play a key role in how happy and peaceful you feel. And if you want to stop these epidemics of abuse, violence, bullying from taking over, you need to start acting now. We can't afford to lose more time. My favorite prescription is a dose of compassion three times daily. Because every child, every human being, every living being deserves compassion, and every child deserves to learn compassion. That is the way to spread happiness in this world, and that's what makes this an idea worth spreading. Thank you.